All right, next up we have Lisa Wynn. Come on up, Lisa. So, Lisa, are, do you eat cereal ever for breakfast? No. <laughs> well, let's say you did. Okay. And let's say you ran out of milk. Okay. Would you consider uh, melting ice cream and then pouring it in your cereal bowl? A cereal bowl? Uh, yes. All right, perfect. <laughs> Good answer. You ready? I guess. <laughs> All right, you're going. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa, and I'm an engineer at Storyblocks. And today, I'm here to talk about checklists and how we can integrate them to help manage risk in DevOps. So when I say checklist lists, I really do mean just a list that you use to mark off completed tasks. Probably one of the most famous checklists comes from Boeing in the 1930s after a disastrous crash during a demo of one of their plane prototypes. Technically, the plane had been working fine but the flight crew had forgotten to release the flight control locks, causing the plane to nosedive after takeoff. People deemed the plane too complicated for a human to fly. However, a group at Boeing decided to try to tackle this problem by using a written pilot's checklist. And using this checklist, pilots were able to fly the initial planes 1.8 million miles without incident. More recently, in the medical industry, they've had usage of checklists after in 2001, a specialist at Johns Hopkins experimented with using checklists so that he could attack all line infections. This five-step checklist was simple. It had things like wash your hands with soap, but the results were they calculated that they had prevented 43 infections, eight deaths, and saved $2 million in costs. So how can we apply this in the software industry? Well, these tasks help, the checklist helped with the task with the memory recall and being explicit the required steps. And these are kind of things that we want to use in, obviously, in things like deployments. There's checks like stakeholder sign-offs, there's testing that we have to get done, and then there's the execution of the task during the deployment itself, and then whatever verifications we need to run afterwards. And if something goes wrong, it's always less stressful if you've already planned out the steps to handle the situation instead of trying to figure it out on the fly when you're slammed with errors. Also, we usually want to figure out why something is going wrong. Uh, maybe that's just me, but if we have a debugging checklist, it's a lot easier and a lot faster to try to narrow down the source of issues. So, as we create these checklists, there are a few things we want to keep in mind. We want to make explicit the desired checks for each step. Something like, check the logs look normal might make sense to you now, but what about to your colleagues or to you at 3 a.m. when you're being paged? <laughs> also, the longer a checklist is, the more likely you're going to miss steps. If you find yourself with a 50-step list, it's probably a sign that you need to break it up. And then as you do this, you want to keep in mind order matters, even for non-sequential tasks. For example, you want to put critical items in the beginning so that way they're less likely to be missed. Also, you want to group things by location so that way you can reduce the overhead in context switching. Now, ideally, your checklist is so simple and clear a computer could run it. And if you find yourself running the same sort of task over and over again, it's probably a good idea to start putting it in code. Unfortunately, though, you can't just develop a checklist, tell people to use it, and then expect to see the results. Checklists are not a one-size-fits-all solution. Say you're updating a financial system, and you have a great workflow for it. That checklist probably doesn't work so well if you're at a web startup instead. That leads to what I think is one of probably the biggest issues with using checklists, and that's they are not effective if people don't use them. And people might not want to use them because they resent them because they think it's a top-down initiative being forced on them, or they somehow think it's pointless. 
So how do you combat this? You have to get user buy-in from leadership and your end users. To do this, you can try to enlist a local champion, someone who can help rally people by pulling on their heartstrings or presenting some evidence, that, so that way they can commit to using the checklist. Also, as with any tool, you want to locally adapt your checklist for the needs of your organization. You can do this by soliciting feedback, or better yet, having users help create the checklist. So hopefully I've convinced you that checklists can actually be a real tool to manage risk in DevOps for things like troubleshooting or deployments. And it's a simple idea, but I think it can pay real dividends. Thank you.